to the festival. Uh, my name is Sergio. I'm uh, coming from Cora Virtual Reality, a company based in Denmark. And um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how content will develop, uh, how virtual reality content will develop over the internet in the next couple of years. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to talk to you, uh, tell you a little bit more about myself so we can get to know each other. Um, so uh, my, my interest in virtual reality, yeah? Is it, okay, closer? Cool. <laughs> so my interest in virtual reality um, actually started while I was doing uh, my master thesis. Uh, I wanted to uh, do something related to advertising and um, I remember that I was perhaps like reading something about this new virtual reality coming up emerging like, and it was going to be a very big thing. Um, but then like I think what really grabbed the hook, like what, what I got really hooked on was on this advert uh, from Target, a uh, retail company in the US, uh, that basically featured uh, this whole storyline uh, with uh, where you were passing by this, uh, this haunted house and uh, you suddenly a crow came in, grabbed your phone and went inside of the house. And then suddenly you had to explore all of the different departments of the house uh, to search for your phone. And um, all of this was like a YouTube campaign. And uh, I, I just remember the first time that I was in a library at CBS and I was with my phone just looking at the, at, at the movie, at, at the YouTube video, doing like this. So, oh, okay, so what's so special about it? And then I started tilting and then I was, whoa! And then like suddenly everybody at the library started looking at me and I felt like this really weird dude with the phone. Um, but it, it, it got me really hooked because it suddenly um, changed the whole perspective like it was uh, using uh, advertising in a storytelling way and, and doing it in a really uh, in engaging way so that you could explore the rooms and then you were taken to the store and you were able to purchase every single item uh, that you saw in this beautifully decorated room. Uh, that they have. I mean, it's, I know, uh, perhaps like uh, from a, capital, a capitalist point of view, perhaps it's, uh, it, it's, it's very beautiful, uh, but uh, and that's, that's my, my stand, uh, stand view. Uh, I, I love adverts and that's why uh, it kind of talked to me in, in that sense. Um, so so I, that, that's when I actually decided to hop onto this medium and explore uh, and explore it a little bit uh, more so i did my bachelor uh, my master thesis around uh, virtual reality and advertising and uh, then after that i landed an internship at Coro. Cora is a, uh, as a business developer. So just to tell you a little bit more about Cora and what this is and who we are, uh, basically, uh, let's start off with the name right off it. Uh, Cora actually comes from Plato. It's a definite, uh, Plato used it to define a place between the existing and the non-existing. So if we roughly translate it, uh, it can be like a place between the physical and the virtual worlds. So we have a bridge between those worlds. The worlds. So I think that that's like that's actually defining um, the company as a whole because it's like we are present in the physical sense. We have a shop in Copenhagen. We were we opened up the first virtual reality shop, and it also works as an innovation hub where people can come in, share ideas, and and explore the technology in itself and um, as a private consumer. But then we're also on, present on the virtual side by producing content and, and providing consultancy services for, for companies. Like over the past year and a half, uh, we've been having projects for, uh, from different types of industries, from uh, NGOs working with, uh, for marketing purposes, healthcare, um, architecture, um, education, so it has been very, very wide. Um, and, and we have been showing that this technology can be used for so much more and uh, that's what we want to aim for and we want to keep exploring this new medium. And, but the, the truth is that this medium is not new. I don't know if uh, most of you know the history of VR, but I'll just make a brief overview of it. Um, just basically, uh, 
this, this technology actually started in the 60s with this big old clunky machine, uh, the Sensorama. Uh, there was this guy called Morton Heiling and he, he wanted to, people to actually step inside of the cinema, in, inside of the movies. So he created this device where basically people had to be shut down from the entire world and all you could see was like uh, the movie in front of you. Actually it was a pretty interesting machine because it it already featured like 3D film and also featured uh, like wind and and smells that were thrown at you. So that was like pretty advanced for the time. Uh, but once you think about it, it's like you're not going to have this in your living room. Let's be honest. So um, so obviously this this wasn't ready. Like this weighed like two tons. Um, but then in the 80s and the 90s, suddenly you had these. Um, uh, all of these companies, these gaming companies, wanted to start, uh, uh, that started to promise virtual reality headsets, like for our home. Suddenly, like, the private consumer was able to access this wonderful technology. And journalists, of course, they started getting the hype of it, and they started to, uh, to talk a lot more about it, and to write more about it, of how we are going to explore Mars, how we are going to explore uh, dinosaurs, or how we, are we going to uh, explore um, uh, like, uh, real estate businesses over, overseas with virtual reality. Uh, or, so a lot of hype was being put into to this technology. And perhaps the most iconic of the, uh, of the virtual reality headsets at the time was Nintendo's Virtual Boy. Uh, basically, if, if you cannot see it, like, uh, it's, it was this headset that you could basically have a, a, a mounting st uh, stand that you could place it on the table and you had to peek, peek into it and this is what you could see inside. This was revolutionary at the time. Yeah, so, so basically, of course, the, the, it, yeah, it, it just wasn't good enough. <laughs> basically, this is very gimmicky, and it was just like a 3D game. So obviously, the technology couldn't keep up with that, all of this hype that was being built around it. And uh, much more was being promised than what the technology could actually deliver. So it ended up becoming a failure. But now, fast forward to 2015, and this is what you have. Suddenly you have this headset where, that people use, and they interact with it very naturally. as if they were part of that world. And it's also such a powerful headset that can actually make you have this whole, these emotions. Like, very powerful ones. And it can even hack your brain so perfectly that can make you do things even though they are not real, like, like eating virtual donuts and opening up your mouth to do so. So it's like, that's, that's how crazy and crazy realistic this technology has become and uh, how powerful it is. So what is virtual reality? What I, when, whenever I like to talk about this, I, uh, uh, to define it, I like to separate these two worlds, virtual from reality. And I focus, start by focusing on reality part. And uh, I'm just going to ask you a very simple question for a 10 a.m. talk. Um, how can your brain know that what you are experiencing is real? Yeah.
and what causes those uh, those explosions in the brain, like those electrical explosions in the brain. <laughs> I, I don't want to make this very philosophical. I want to make this a little bit more practical in terms of... Uh, so, uh, anyone wants to... Uh, I, I don't know. The answer that I'm looking for, it's basically in, in our senses. Like, you were, you, were grab, you, you were grasping that. It's like, basically, it's, it's our senses through what we can see, through what you can hear, through what you can smell and taste. Yeah, it is, it is. But I mean, the, the whole idea of, of reality in itself, like that our, your brain can actually understand that like, or make uh, this, or can be comfortable with the idea that this, what you are experiencing right now is real. It actually all comes down with what you are experiencing, what you are feeling and, uh, and all of your senses are capturing. Because all of that, it's like your brain is being constantly stimulated. Like you have all of this uh, audio stimuli, visual stimuli and, and uh, um, oral stimuli. Like you have all of this uh, going on and that's what causes like the brain exp uh, those neural explosions in your brain like those electrical uh, impulses and 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 it's that that your brain uses to make a, an understanding that this what you are experiencing is real now may i i just want to make this because it's it's a nice jump from uh, from the real reality that we have and that's the, the, that's that's what I was talking about. That's like experiencing reality, like uh, nowadays through your senses, and um, uh, that's that's basically you being stimulated by the world. Uh, but with virtual reality, it's basically instead of having the world sending in those stimuli, you simply have a computer that it's doing that, and that it's creating all of those sort of. Uh, the, the simulated world of stimuli that it's going into your brain and making you feel that you are actually present in one place. And that's the key component of virtual reality. It's like it's the, the ability of you being able to be transported to somewhere else. It's the ability for you to be in the center of the action and experience everything as if you were there. And that enables what you were t telling as well, like that it, it becomes a lot more active and a lot more engaging as well, because people feel that they are there and that they can explore that world around them, even if it's just like looking around. But it, it gives them that impulse. It gives them that ability. So what you, what you have is, is also by, by being able to transport someone else, it's that you have this capacity, this, this new uh, communication tool at your disposal. And you can play around with the emotions as well of people in a much more empathic way, perhaps. And if we go back to research, if we focus, for example, on the Dale's Cone of Experience, which basically correlates the way that people um, perform a task um, to the way that they memorize things, uh, we can see that virtual reality can have a huge impact on the memory part. So if we take a look at this, uh, at this inverted pyramid, uh, this is basically a translation of, uh, of, um, uh, of Dale's cone of experience. Um, basically, if we start, uh, what, what the, roughly translated this is means that if we are performing an, a very abstract activity such as reading, that means that our brains can retain up to 10% of that information. But if we can do if we can make that activity a little bit more objective such as like simulating the activity which is what virtual reality can deliver then that means that we can our brains can retain up to 90 percent of that experience and i think that's very very powerful and that's also one of uh, the key elements and abilities of virtual reality what i wanted specify a little bit more now 
It's about how all this is going to evolve over the internet. And um, let's, in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to make this sort of retrospective. And I want you to take a look at these different websites and how have they evolved. And just think for a moment. This is Apple's website in 96. This is Apple's website today. Netflix. Netflix today. Oh. Vimeo. Vimeo today. It all looks so distant from now, right? But uh, I mean, what, what has actually changed in all this? The, the answer is basically in the way that we communicate and, and the way that companies communicate. Um, it, it all started from uh, this very text-based. The internet was this depository of information where basically you just scrammed all of your uh, text in there and that was it because people it was simple like uh, you the bandwidth is also very limited so basically text uh, was was uh, was the main uh, drive of the internet uh, per se so only a couple of years after uh, you started having companies uh, working a lot more uh, communicating a lot more with imagery and right now you have Companies that work a lot more with video. I mean, take Facebook, for example. It's very hard, like, just to be scrolling on Facebook and just not stop on a video. Like, that's, that's how the internet works. Right now, video is king. But in a couple of years from now, uh, virtual reality will take place because we're changing from an information paradigm to a more experiential paradigm. What that means is, that, for example, uh, in terms of educational purposes, for example, if you want to go and, and browse and, and get to know a little bit more, for example, about the Great Wall of China, uh, instead of going to Wikipedia and reading all of that text down there, you'll actually be able to step inside of the Great Wall of China and see how it looks like and see the great battles that happened before you and, uh, and see everything in full uh, in there and understanding much more vividly. And right now, for example, in education, what's being made for this, uh, I just want to show you a G Google Expeditions program, which I think that it's unbelievably cool. And it's also setting an example of how this will be used in there. So I think this is like a perfect example of how this is going to unfold in the education side of it. And, um, but at the same time, if you think about like the regular consumer, uh, for example, just for looking things up, 
uh, on a do-it-yourself kind of basis. Instead of you having to go through all of those manuals and step-by-step -step sort of thing, you can perhaps like start practicing yourself with, for example, a model, a 3D model of uh, the device that you want to repair on your own and have and see how everything unfolds together. I mean, from a technical standpoint for companies, it's also very valuable because, for example, if you're uh, training your crew uh, for reparation purposes, uh, this can also be a very cheap uh, way and and uh, and a very motivation, more motivational wise um, way for for them to to do this sort of thing and to understand exactly like what sort of components do actually go inside of everything of such intricate objects, for example. But it's also, for example, going to be very interesting for training purposes. Uh, instead of having uh, manuals, uh, people having to go over the internet and reading all of these massive manuals on, for example, how to uh, repair things, repair railroads, for example, something a little bit more technical, they can just try it out on their own and be on the railroad tracks and experience that with a much more safer environment as well. And you start having companies, uh, this is for example the example of a, of a Russian railroad company that is starting to, uh, to use virtual reality for simulation purposes. And, uh, and I think that it's so amazing because it's like it provides a very safe environment and at the same time it can mimic exactly the, the same movements as you would have in real life. So, and that's, that's how real and how we will start having more of these experiences over the internet as the time moves along. Um, just wanted, yeah. But if we look, for example, uh, from another point of view, for example, from the healthcare perspective, uh, this can also be very impactful on mental illnesses. Uh, instead of, for example, people having to go over uh, through all of these medical research websites and trying to see, for example, how to cure phobias. Uh, you'll actually be, uh, be able to, uh, for example, do it on your home, like cure your phobia from home instead of having to uh, go and see a therapist for like over a year just to cure your fear of spiders. Uh, for example, just for you to understand how this is being used uh, to treat phobias right now, it's uh, the, the way that it's being done, it's with, uh, you have therapists that place uh, their patients under the virtual reality environments where, for example, if the person has afraid of spiders, then they will see a spider crawling up their hand. And, and at the same time, the therap uh, therapist will also use a stick to give the more real feeling, the real sensation of actually the spider crawling up their hand. The person, the, the patient will know that that's not real, will know that it's not, uh, that it, it's not there, the spider is not actually there, but the brain is seeing those things. The brain is feeling the touch of the, of the, uh, of the stick, so that must be real for the brain. So it becomes to, but since it's not real, then the brain starts getting a little bit more comfortable with the idea of being around the spider. And that's how it works with, with phobia treatment using virtual reality. And it actually has been shown that, for example, the time span uh, used in, in treating these, uh, these diseases actually is much, much shorter than traditional, uh, uh, traditional um, uh, therapy. So uh, it's, in, instead of having to go to someone else to do this, perhaps you'll be able to do this from your home as well, and diseases as, as such. Also, it will be very interesting to explore spaces, even though that you are not there, or even though that they do not exist. So instead of you having to go through listings and seeing all of these beautiful images of places that you don't know if they will be just like that. You'll perhaps be able to uh, go to Airbnb and put on your goggles and see how the place actually looks like from the inside and, uh, and start experiencing uh, the house before actually traveling there. I mean, who's has, 
I'm, I'm talking about Airbnb, but I can also be talking about, for example, uh, renting accommodation for, for long term overseas. For example, if you're traveling over to, to New York, like you're going to work there, you want to visit the place that you want, that you want to work, uh, that, that you are going to work or even you are going to live. So before renting out and before making out big decisions, like, you should be able to, to do that. From, uh, from overseas and I think like having these sort of advantages over the internet and having all these sort of advantages being uh, delivered right to you uh, will, will start to become a lot more common in our daily lives and it will be so much normal because it, it, it will also be able to impact for example uh, our current online shopping experience for example, you'll start having pop-up stores, uh, uh, you'll start having like virtual shopping stores, for example. Adidas has, has tried this already, Adidas in Sweden, like with, uh, where you get a tour through the, um, through the store and you have these icons hovering around and you are able to, um, to click on the objects and, for example, make the pur purchase right away. Um, but the truth about our current online experience is that it's very, uh, it's, it's very efficient and it's something that it's very um, easy for us to do. It's like everything's at the distance of a click. But the truth is, but it's, it's not experiential. It's not uh, relevant for us. I mean, it's not the same thing as going to the store. It lacks that environment. It lacks the environment that you have from the brands at the store. So uh, what you have here over the internet, like well, with, with virtual reality, is the possibility of creating uh, more immersive and unique ways of shopping online for your cons uh, customers. And that means, for example, if in the future, if you want to buy guns, you'll have something as extraordinary as this. So it's, it's sort of wacky, of course, but it's, that's just how crazy uh, we can be shopping right now. Like you could be just like floating uh, some guns or just playing around with the, opening up a book and playing around with a beautiful dragon that walks out of it. So that's, that's how fabulous it can be. And even in terms of, for example, advertising, I think it will change as well because Okay, let's face it, like if we are starting to browse the internet using our virtual reality headsets, companies will have to start betting a lot on advertising. And, um, and you'll, you'll be popped up, uh, popped out uh, with a lot of, bombarded with a lot of adverts as well. So uh, what you have right now today, it's, it's like you have uh, these adverts that are very, um, uh, that you have these unique storytelling ways of, of seeing these things. And I think those, those the, the adverts that, that really stick out are the ones that, that play around with your emotions as well, such as, for example, the, the magical Sony Bravia one that everybody knows here with the bouncing balls. But what you have, what, what I believe that will be become a lot more unique and a lot more powerful for, for brands will also be the way of creating experiences for unique experiences for the customers as well. And such as, for example, the one that we did for Dong Energy. Uh, so Dong Energy, it's a company, uh, it's your basic uh, boring energy company. Um, uh, but what they, they did is, they wanted to create this experience of, an, uh, of going to an, an offshore windmill farm and give it out to their consumers and at the same time educate them on the importance of the offshore windmill farms in, uh, in, uh, in Denmark and at the same time renewable energies. So they created this experience and created events around town for, uh, for their consumers to also change their perspective and it was just fabulous for them because they were also able to, um, uh, to uh, this, this view, like this was viewed over one million times in, uh, over the internet. And it was a really nice experience for them because they were able to 
start telling a story in a more in a more engaging way as well and more relevant for their consumers and i believe that we will start having a lot more of these over the internet in the next couple of years now what i believe that it's actually going to start uh, what is actually the pinnacle of the social uh, the, the sort of experiential internet it's actually the social aspect of it and when we start seeing face, uh, facebook uh, betting a lot on on the social experience part it's uh, it's just marvelous to see um, i just wanted to share a couple of minutes with you uh, the first live demo that they did with the Facebook spaces where they can actually where you start having interactions with people inside of virtual reality environments Which I think that it's just incredible and this is basically going to set the stone in the experiential uh, internet, so Here it is. First live demo in VR All right we are in virtual reality right here at Oculus Connect. <laughs> hey guys, how's it going? Hey Mark, it's great to see you. Hey Mark. Even though you're cartoons, it's pretty amazing that our minds can just automatically understand the facial expression so I can understand what you're feeling right now. Right. So we can actually make eye contact. Uh, our mouths move when we talk so we know who's speaking in the room. Uh, I can even make expressions. I can smile. I can look surprised. Oh. I can look confused. Uh, you're making the sound effects right now. That's, that's me. I can even laugh if you say something funny. Here, take a look at your own avatar. Whoa, why, why, why did you make me look like a young version of Justin Timberlake? <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, uh, because we're in virtual reality, we're here together, and we have the space where we can just do whatever we want, right? So do you want to go somewhere? Yeah, let's. In fact, how about I take us to the bottom of the ocean? Sounds good. All right. Whoa. <laughs> sharks. Oh. Yeah. Those are sharks. All right. That's a lot of sharks. <laughs> All right, how about we go somewhere else? How about we go to another planet, say, Mars? All right, guys, how about we go somewhere where there's some more people? You know, that's kind of my thing. Um, what about Facebook offices? That's great, great idea. All right. OK. All right, here we are, back. Uh, back on Earth. All right, so here we are. This is, this is my, my office in the, in the, um, at Facebook. You know, the point of this, and the reason why we're here, is to talk about how you know we have this space together in VR, and how we can go do anything that we want together, right? So, you want to play a game? Oh, that sounds great. Let's try a uh, let's try a quick game of cards, huh? There we go. Okay. Two for you. Two for you. And All right. What are we three. playing? Let's just do a quick game of high card. Ready? Flip them over on three. One, two, three. Oh, oh, I win. There. Let's see. Oh, I, oh man. I uh nice. I barely ever won in demo practice, so you know I'm. We didn't plan that at all. <laughs> well, another game we can play might be chess. Now, I'll go first. Queen to center of board. Uh, I'm not sure what to do with that. Uh, in, 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 in virtual reality, you can make any move you want, apparently, but all right. How about oh, here you go. Completely different. You know, um, when I was in school, I actually used to fence. Oh. You got another one of these? Uh, I can do one better. Check this out. I will just make my own. <laughs> Draw this real quick. Like this. Oh, like so. I'm going to go zoop like this. All right. I'm good. Ha ha. Swish, swish. Swish, swish. Ha ha. Ha ha. All right. Oh, another thing we can do together would be just watch a simple video. Now, unlike on the phone, I can zoom this up to any size we'd like. Check it there out. Go. Somewhat like our own private movie theater. <laughs> it was well, so happy. Yeah, I think this is starting to show like exactly how live and how crazy the internet can become, and uh, and how we will start having all of these crazy wacky experiences, and we how we will need to also start focusing a lot more on these universes 
that we create around those experiences. So having said this, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very looking forward for this exciting future that we have ahead. So if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to pop them up now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No, I, I, I completely understand your point and, and I, I agree that there's like, uh, there's a, pervert, a perverse uh, aspect of this technology that uh, we, we are not perhaps foreseeing right now. And, um, but but uh, you, I think you're right because it's like we have this technology that suddenly starts to uh, talk to our primal, primal brain, like to the inner reptile in us. And, uh, and start making us, for example, start eating virtual donuts and opening up our mouths. And that's a bit crazy. And uh, for example, once you start having like corporations that wants to start um, affecting that on a consumer level, I think that that's like, there needs to be a boundary in there somewhere, definitely. Uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, but I still, at, up, up until this moment, I think that like we're in this very beautiful blossoming age of this technology where I think people are just doing beautiful things with it and, and creating it for very interesting purposes uh, besides those nefastious effects. Um, and, and I think that in, in the end, people will start seeing this more of a, uh, a technology that will help us in, in the good side more the good side will overturn the bad side and that's always how, how it will be with when te technology disrupts us. Uh, I mean we saw it with the internet for example I mean we can uh, we have all of this beautiful thing of being able to um, to go online and chat with our friends but at the same time we have that the fastest uh, part of it where we have predators online that are stalking people so it's like uh, with every technology it's like there's a good and a bad side of it and uh, you just have to wait in the balance and put put those things on a scale and just decide but i think the good things will definitely come out on uh, out of this yeah no no please Yeah. Well, a couple of things. One is, um, when you went, with your inverse pyramid, you said yeah. about the experience of reading is less, um, let's say, absorbable mm -hmm. than um, the experience of virtual reality. So that, does that mean, for example, if you're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, you would get like 10% of what you read. But if you experience that, if you go and shoot To Kill a Mockingbird and you experience it as virtual reality, you'll get much more of that the story. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, if if we cross with the if we cross with the uh, with the the Dale's kind of experience, this was actually like an experiment done in the in the eighties. There's a paper, research paper done on this, and if we see this according to his research, then uh, we can definitely say this. Like we can say that it, that it will be more impactful for us uh, to actually experience how to kill a mockingbird. And be on the set, and be exactly, and see exactly uh, how it was back then, and so on. So, and, and and, I'll push that out. yeah. When we see that about uh, with uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, so we didn't see my it's because I'm completely ignorant. I didn't actually do it. I'm looking from the producer's point of view. Yeah. So, um, you didn't see my thought. Are they real people who are then? I mean, how can they react to the real? I mean, I'm sorry. I'm 
Of course. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, just in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Uh, did you see Mark Zuckerberg yeah, like so. okay, that was the base thing. Like he was having the headset yeah. and then he had uh, you might have not noticed but he was having like this sensor over there. And um, and he, the sensor was capturing the headset and at the same time he was wearing some controllers, okay? okay. And what what the sensor does it's like to capture all of that and translate that into the virtual world. And uh, so what, what you were seeing were avatars, representations of those people that were in a separate room somewhere so else. Oh, okay. Some, yeah, th they were people, they were people. Okay. So uh, so they had to react somehow, which is the process. Not the it was, they were just like, the thing is that, for example, the controllers, they also enable, for example, they have sensor on sensors on the fingers like they can see exactly for example if you take if you point to somewhere like it will also translate that into the character into the avatar so that's why it felt also very realistic i'm a bit unaware of how they did with um, uh, with the whole emo facial expression thing but i'm i don't know if this was like the consumer version that they have right now but for example oculus they've been purchasing uh companies that are working for example in uh, in um, ah eye tracking for example and facial expression tracking so if you have all of these sensors built in the in the headset it's easy to translate that so uh it's that's basically uh, so, but where it is yeah of course <laughs> Yeah. You know, it should, you know, like whatever. And you see it on TV after you get it, especially juice. Um, is the is the method of shooting for virtual reality very different? No, it's it's pretty similar. Uh, but I think that it's it the it has to you have to take into consideration a lot, for example, and the uh, the whole aspect of the environment and the and the whole camera thing. I think the the major um sorry. Coming up again. Uh, the major key difference is it's it's also in the camera because it, you're you're suddenly like you don't have a director that's basically telling exactly like where where you want to frame like where do you want your uh, your audience to have the attention on, you know. There is a role. There is a role in there because it's like even though that you he cannot do this, he can give you some clues and, and guide you into it. So for example, uh, you have some techniques such as, for example, m creating movement to attract attention. Uh, if you have, for example, a ball that it's swinging by, like just running by across the field around you, like most of the people will follow the ball and where it will move, where it will lead to. So that's, for example, setting the attention to that point over there. You know, or for example, if you highlight, like if you create, for example, lighting environments more, uh, more bright on an area and darken out the other parts, people will most likely be guided to that direction. But the thing is, it's like not 100%. Uh, you, you won't know 100% that people will be looking in there. So it's uh, because you cannot control them. Um, you can guide their attention, try to guide their attention, but it's still up to them to decide what they want to see. So I think that it's, it's um, uh, the major difference. It's also thinking about the environments in itself, like the worlds that you are shooting in and uh, the things that you are doing. Because afterwards, in terms of uh, a shooting process and so on, uh, and sorry, in the uh, post-production -pro post part and so on, it, def it differs only in terms of the stitching also, and uh, because you need to stitch the images, um, and and perhaps also like in the way that you are editing, because you need to think, for example, where you need to center the action, uh, so that, for example, if if you center your action here, and you have. Um, I'm getting way too specific on this, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to dive into it, but for example, if, if, for example, if you have a band that is playing over here, a guy with a, band, a banjo, and uh, so obviously, and if you cut and you make a frame, and suddenly you are at this beach, but you're standing at the tree, and the whole beach and the, and the swimmers are like on the other side, people m might not notice that 
the swimmers are on the other side. So you need to, for example, change the whole uh, action for the swimmers and the beach part to be here in front of you and the tree on the back. So you have to think of all of those aspects. It's like it's a little bit more tricky in that sense, but it's still like in terms of, uh, yeah, but in, in, in terms of the regular production part, it's, it's pretty much the same. It differs in those aspects, more or less. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, there's another question back. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how you foresee how it's going to storytelling that our colleague was asking in the community to go? Because so far, what we had is experience for every single thing we want to do. Everything. I want to be tailored for Thailand, I want to jump on a parachute, I need to practice sex. Everything is there. But there is no story involving about my reactions. So far, what we have is a, a new way to communicate to our brain. Mm -hmm. But for the, even for the future, it can be done through a pill that, like Total Recall, we can get those memories, fake or true, and it doesn't matter because it's memories. And you can visualize what, whatever we want to explain in our brains. So far, it's a way to communicate to our brain. What I want to know from you is how, our, as creators, we can develop stories for our potential consumers buying stories, the traditional stories, cinematographically, audiovisually, that bringing the, 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 the persona as a main character in the middle of the story, in a 360 experience, and then we're going to be obliged to shoot, not as a frame, as a 360 experience. So how do you foresee that? How we can do that? How we, <laughs> how we can tower that, yep. not being in the hands of publicity, or just for a simple experience, or just a training purpose, or healthcare? Um, I think that, uh, First of all, what, what you're talking about... No, no, no. That's the point we are now. The point that we are right now, I think that it's like... That, that question that you're asking about, like, the storytelling in 360 video and in virtual reality, for, it's, it's still the holy grail of this industry. Nobody knows exactly how to do it. Like, it's, it's still a very wild west and people are experimenting a lot with it. Um, and, uh, and right now, like, what we are using techniques that are being used in film right now. But what you have is also, uh, you, people are seeing that some techniques that don't actually, uh, uh, that some filming techniques don't actually apply to the 360 format. So it's, it's simply, I, I believe that we are like in the beginning uh, of this whole industry and the beginning of this whole um, uh, medium that we are just exploring, starting to explore how to communicate with this, like how the, the Lumiere brothers started. And uh, this is just, I, I cannot foretell exactly how, how it will be, but uh, so, definitely. So, so we have the format for TV live, because mm -hmm. we can do a TV format live. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something that you can really interact with the storyline. Exactly. I mean, it, it, there's definitely, like, a, I believe that it's, it's starting to open up also, for example, for the possibility of you being able, since it's a format where you will practically have this decision power of looking anywhere you want to go, perhaps you, you can also start creating, like, more uh, diverse storylines where, for example, you start having choices, like you have the audience starting to become uh, more active in that role of, for example, uh, oh, I don't want to go this way, I want to go that way, and I want to explore the, the dragon in the dungeon down there instead of the little princess on the top of the, ca of the, of the tower. So it's like, it's, it, uh, and, and you can, for example, create and start uh, thinking more in that sense of how this will decisions and and uh, video will or in virtual reality will affect the outcome of it and and what I see is like it's it's emerge right right now what what 
what I see is that we have a, we're starting to see a merge between the filming and the gaming industries a lot more than that and uh, because you, you well you have all of these um, virtual elements that are on games that basically they spend months and eight and years just developing these characters these worlds and and suddenly they are very experts and keen on uh, the ability of the players being able to perform actions and and be able to perform um, uh, random things and affecting the outcome of the game in the aftermath and and I think that it's like um, it's it's definitely one of the ways like to cooperate with these sort of industry like you have the filming that it's very powerful to convey emotions and to uh, and, and people and the narrative part of it and at the same time you have these gamers these really hardcore gamers that are very knowledgeable on on how we need to as a, as a person to act to interact and to do things and 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 also uh, to explore the environment so if you start mixing these two up i think you will start to become having more of these very powerful storytelling environments and and experiences and suddenly you start having westworld and virtual reality for example so that's that's more or less how i can see that this is going to be shaped down um, if if I answered your question a little yeah, bit more, yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, yeah. So, but it's it's impossible for me to tell you besides experiences because what i think that it's it's also going to drive this it's also the the ability of creating these unique experiences for for people to to go for example on the backstage and and uh see like uh, paul mccarthy playing uh rehearsing on the backstage before uh going on the, on a concert or uh, doing all these sort of intimistic uh, environments and intimistic, uh, intimate, um, yeah, uh, moments for the audience, for the for the viewer, so they can have a much more re uh, more uh, a much deeper connection with also the not the brands but also uh, uh, with everything with artists. So it's it's I, I believe there's also like a, a huge potential in there, and it's it's hard for me to say that it's. I think that both will will also come uh, will rise, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we had one last question, but it, okay. Yeah, but now, I mean, now we need to, to give yeah. part to Prota. So thanks very much. Of course, yeah. thank you. Thanks.